Now I mentioned that we're starting today on the path of individual liberation and so this was the level of teachings as they were originally taught by the Buddha, the historic Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha and what we are looking at here and the teachings here are taking those teachings from the perspective of Tibetan Buddhism. We're not giving the complete teachings of this branch, uh, uh, which the only one that survived today. There were originally 18 different branches of Buddhism from the original teachings of the Buddha. The only one of which that survived today is Theravada. So it's one point of view of the original teachings. And we're not trying to give a complete introduction to or a complete set of instructions from their point of view. We're only giving it from the point of view of Tibetan Buddhism. Okay, so it's, it's limited in that way. But it is some of the core parts of those teachings. And we view it as the foundation of everything that then builds on top of that. Uh, another phrase that's sometimes used for these teachings are the path of the elders. So you may hear that used as an expression sometimes. Uh, but they should never be disparaged as being lesser or inferior in any way. And one can achieve enlightenment on these, on you just using this path. Okay? So I want to make sure that that's very clear. So in doing this, the approach that we're using in this class is called based on what is called the three trainings. The three trainings are three parts. The first part is ethics. The second part is meditation. And the third part is wisdom. So as we go through each of these four paths, one of the things that we will do is look at the ethics from the perspective of that path. We'll go through various meditations associated with that path. And then we will look at the perspective of wisdom, the result of having done that path. Now at one level, they're all kind of the same. Okay? They're just tweaking things in little different ways that someone along the way felt made it more effective. Okay? Uh, but the, you'll see that there are very strong similarities uh, among all of these paths. Uh, but there are differences as well as a part of that. So we'll start with ethics. So at the time of the Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, the historic Buddha in the 5th century BCE, uh, about 25, 2600 years ago, uh, he would lived, if you'll recall from the other sessions that we did, we were talking about the history of Shakyamuni Buddha. At that time, there were some preliminary practices that one did in order to prepare for meditation. So not unlike and may have been the source of this idea of the three uh, teachings. And so they would do these preliminary practices, the first of which was, in fact, ethics. And so you were expected to practice certain ethics before you proceeded with doing these other yogic and meditation practices. Well, looking at Buddhism from a broad perspective, the ethics can be broken down into what is sometimes referred to as the three vows. And the three vows are associated with three of the paths, so Tantra and Dzogchen in, in this case are combined together, but the path of individual liberation, the path of the Bodhisattva or altruistic intention, and the path of Tantra. And so there's a separate vow for each level of these. And so we want to take a look at that. As you know, ethics basically deals with what is right and what is wrong. And there's very little agreement about that. Uh, there are lots of different perspectives on what is right and what is wrong. In some cases, it's also about who gets to determine what is right and what is wrong. And so in Buddhism, we determine that for ourselves. That's the point of view here. There's no one, there's not a god or anybody else, a priest saying this is what right, this is what is wrong, although sometimes it comes pretty close to that, um, but that in fact is not the case. Uh, the Dalai Lama summarized these three vows this way. The first vow, he said, is do good or at least do no harm. That's the heart, the essence of what that first vow is all about. 
The second one is to engage in altruistic intention and action. That's the bodhisattva vow. The third one is to maintain pure view. That's the tantric vow. Pure view means you see all beings as Buddhas, all sounds as mantras, all thoughts as the wisdom of a Buddha, and all phenomena as a perfect Buddha field. Okay? That's the most difficult one to actually do <laughs> out of these three. Seems the simplest, but it's actually the hardest to do. Moment by moment, day in and day out. So, what we look at is that there are additional things, and we'll talk about some of these, but as we look at them, it's best to think of these more not as the rules, but as guidelines to help you in achieving these three vows that we just talked about. So, remember that one of the key principles in Buddhism is karma. It has to do with actions, cause and effect. We do an action that results in some effect from that action. So some other traditions look at these rules as being basically commandments or hard rules. And we could use a Christian example uh, or the Jewish example where we look at the Ten Commandments. Okay? Those are said to have come from God. So we have God saying, these are the rules, follow these rules. And actually there are 613 of those rules in the Torah. So those traditions have all of those rules. But that can also be problematic when you have all of these fixed hard rules. For example, some of those rules deal with the temple, which no longer exists. So it's not even possible to follow some of those rules because it required that there was a temple in which to do certain things. Okay? So those kind of rules can get in trouble. Also, when you have fixed rules like that, you can run into problems as things change. So there are rules in certain lists, if you will, not necessarily any specific list, but as times change, things come up that were not issues at the time those rules were written. And all of a sudden, you don't have any rules that deal directly with those things anymore. Okay? Or our understanding of things change over time. And so the way something was interpreted, even though it's talked about in the rules, the interpretation and understanding of that is no longer the same. Okay? And then trying to apply the rules also becomes difficult. So just to give a couple of examples of that, uh, abortion. Okay, now, I have no doubt that abortion was done in ancient times, but there are no commandments specifically dealing with abortion in the Christian tradition. Okay? They're making interpretations based on other ones about how to deal with abortion. There are none to my knowledge in the Buddhist tradition, no guidelines dealing specifically with abortion. Now you could interpret it, do not kill. Okay? And Buddhists do look at the conception as the moment of uh, a being coming into existence, at which point then abortion would be an issue from a Buddhist point of view. The Jewish tradition, life began with the first breath of life. Okay? So then you have a different point of view about when this fetus comes into actual existence, and Christians have interpreted it still as conception in, in many cases. But again, it gets, you know, there's not a hard, fast rule. So how do you interpret that? Another example would be homosexuality. Now homosexuality is talked about in the Christian Bible in a couple of places. One place in the Old Testament dealing specifically with male homosexuality, and a couple places in the New Testament deal with both of those. But our understanding of homosexuality today is very different than it was at that time. Okay? So our understanding from a scientific point of view of what it is, how it exists, and so forth, the reasons for it are very different. So that means as we look at the rules, are the rules, if you will, still appropriate? So a flexible approach to ethics can have a great benefit in terms of understanding and interpreting what is going on. So I think that's one of the benefits of the approach 
used by Buddhists in terms of ethics, as opposed to some other traditions where those are interpreted as hard and fast rules that can never be changed. Now, not all Christians do that, of course, and, and neither do all Jews or anybody else in, in other traditions that have those lists of rules. So I don't mean to, to say that all people in that tradition are that way or to disparage them in any way either. But I do believe, personally, that flexible approaches to ethics have a significant advantage to be able to adjust and adapt to the times, to the circumstances, to things that come up that never existed at the time the rules were previously written. But again, it's not about right and wrong, it's kind of a contextual thing, a relative ethics. But even relative ethics can get you into trouble. You can push relativism to its extreme, at which case everything is relative and there's absolutely no right or wrong. Okay? So that can also be a problem because it provides no guidance in terms of what's an appropriate thing to do or not do. Well, I can do anything I want because it doesn't matter. Anything is right or wrong. Okay? And sometimes we push that limit within Buddhism as well. So, but it leaves us with no real, legal, no real guidelines to use. Some people argue, well, let's use the legal system, whatever legal system we happen to be working with as a guideline. Now, I remember working for somebody who said, if it's legal, it's ethical. <laughs> I mean, that was his rule about ethics, was whether it was legal or not. And some people feel that way. But most of us feel there are some things that the law doesn't really address, that there are basic principles that are important in terms of how we respect and deal with other people and so forth that the law doesn't necessarily require. And so there are other issues that we need to, to take into account in the process of dealing particularly with other people. Uh, Western philosophers have also tried to deal with this in different ways, come up with different approaches. Uh, some of them come up with means, focus on the means of the actions that are involved. Others focus on the ends or the results of the actions that we take. Uh, deontology, for example, focuses on the means. And one of the most popular of those philosophical approaches is called duty-based ethics. In other words, we have certain duties that we are responsible for, that we must follow these kinds of duties, these actions. Hmm? What was the word? Deontology. 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 Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a philosophy of ethics. And so, uh, but the standard of that approach is that it must be universal and unconditional. That creates a problem, <laughs> okay? Try to think of a rule that has absolutely no exceptions to it, okay? The most universal rule I can think of in all the various systems of ethics is something like do not kill, or more specifically do not murder, because a lot of traditions allow killing outside of killing people. Okay? But they do allow killing people under certain conditions. Self-defense, warfare, other kinds of things. I don't know of a single rule. I haven't, maybe there is one, but I have never come up with a single rule that applies in every possible circumstance and condition in an absolute way. There may be some, but I, I'm not aware of any. So having that kind of a criterion makes the application of this very difficult. Uh, the reverse of that then, there is uh, teleology, which deals with the ends. So instead of the, the means, it focuses on the ends, the results or consequences of our action. And the most uh, popular of that one is called utilitarianism. And this one focuses on the greatest good for the greatest number. Democracy, if you will, okay? Majority rules. So the problem with this one is the same kind of a problem that we face in democracy is what about the minorities, okay? Anybody who's in a minority position related to any particular issue all of a sudden has no say, no position following this approach. It's only about majority rules. 
Okay? So that presents a real problem too. Now, in terms of dem democratic governments, we typically do have rights that protect certain groups and so forth, uh, but some groups are getting those rights and other groups are not getting those rights. And so we see battles, for example, today about gay marriage. Some people have rights for marriage, other groups do not have, or in some states they do, in other states they do not. So those are the kind of examples that we face just trying to come up with a system to create a set of rules to follow when we look at ethics. So it can be a real challenge to, to be able to do that. Now, at the time of Buddha, there was a group called Shramanans. And the Shramanans uh, were the ones that were the yogis. They were the ones that believed in karma and so forth. And so uh, the principle of karma, in a kind of Western way, what goes around comes around, a little more complicated than that from the Eastern perspective. But the idea is that every action that you have has consequences. Okay? So what you do, results in something that's going to affect you at some time. The word karma actually means action, so it's referring to our actions and the causes and effects related to those, uh, but it doesn't deal specifically with why good things happen to bad people and why bad things happen to good people. And that's one of those areas that ethics really struggles with. And so, in, in terms of karma, the way they envisioned this was that it's like karma, our action plants a seed in our consciousness. And it stays in that consciousness until at some point it ripens. The right conditions come along. So the metaphor, the seed, is like a seed that you might have and you put in the ground, but in the desert there's not much rain for periods of time, and so it just sits in the ground. But at some point, we get a thunderstorm, and we get some rain, and it's watered, and so the conditions of the soil, and the water, and the sunlight, all help that to ripen, and to sprout, and grow a plant, okay? So karma is envisioned something like that, as a seed planted not in the ground, but in our own consciousness. And another part of the belief of the shamanas was reincarnation. And so this seed, if it doesn't ripen in this lifetime, will ripen in another lifetime. And this cycle of reincarnation goes on and on and on until you achieve enlightenment, at which point that stops. Okay? So these seeds are still there over and over and over indefinitely until they either ripen or you achieve enlightenment. And in the process of achieving enlightenment, you deal with those seeds, you purify those seeds. So there are actually two ways to get rid of that karma. And we typically think here in terms of negative karma, but keep in mind there's also positive karma. And so good things that can ripen as well to benefit us. And so one of the things that we can do is do various purification practices. And as we move along through the course, we will do some of those purification practices as a way of dealing with karma, getting rid of the karma, without having to just wait for it to ripen in and of itself on its own. Okay? So that's an important principle as a part of this. It comes basically from the principle of uh, started to say interdependence, that's not the one I want. Impermanence, another I word. Impermanence, so nothing is permanent including karma, okay, or those seeds. There are ways of dealing with that, and that's important. So, another way of looking at karma, a kind of practical way, is you plant the seed, if you repeat that same kind of action, that reinforces the strength of that seed, okay? If you repeat it several times, it becomes a habit. Okay? So this whole process is very much like the process of habituation. Or from a brain perspective, what we're doing is creating neural connections within the brain that get reinforced through these actions, which makes it easier to do each time and becomes more of a habit. 
Now, from a brain perspective, we're usually only talking about it in connection to this lifetime, not something that then moves on to another lifetime. But that is the way that we learn and do things in this lifetime. And so as we learn certain actions that become problematic for us in this lifetime, that's part of what we're dealing with in this Buddhist practice, is dealing with those neural connections that we've created in our own brain through habituation and trying to get rid of those habits. It's very much like what the Buddha talked about in terms of karma and getting rid of those seeds, if you will. It's just that the seeds, a little bit different biophysical arrangement than uh, what the Buddha talked about. Okay. So the first vow, let's go back then to the first vow and ethics that we were talking about before. And so the basic part is do good in order to benefit others. So, our actions benefit others, but self-interest can oftentimes be a barrier to that. The doing good for others, uh, sometimes our own preferences, our own biases and so forth can get in the way. In fact, in Western society, our own self-interest is actually a fairly major focus. We can focus on ourselves and emphasize ourselves and, and so forth. And so that then often actually becomes a barrier to trying to benefit others. But there's also a flip side to that. If we don't take care of ourselves, it can also be difficult to do things to benefit others. Okay? So it's not all one or the other. There's a, a balance, a middle way. The Buddha talked about the middle way in various approaches to doing things. Uh, I don't know that he talked about it specifically in terms of self-interest, but certainly from a Western perspective, there are issues of, of self that we do need to take care of ourselves, at least to the point to be able to then do things to help benefit others. So there is extremes on either side of this approach. But it also goes beyond a balance between the two of those. Uh, in, it's insufficient just to do that. And so what we need to do is extinguish this egotism that we sometimes developed. And we need to get beyond that. Uh, now the golden rule is one of those approaches that is a little bit like that. And so do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. So that transcends self self-interest and so we're going beyond that to try and do something that is of benefit to others if you will. Sometimes we'll see words like surrender or sacrifice or generosity in various religious traditions. Those are all very similar, very closely related to this idea of doing good for others. Um, but you do have to be careful about taking that to an absolute extreme. Um, because if we're unable to do good for others, then under certain circumstances, at least we need to do no harm. Okay? So that's the other part of it. Do good for others, but if you can't do good for others because of circumstances or whatever, at least do no harm. Okay? And that's kind of the fallback, plan B <laughs> position, if you will. Fall back on that. Uh, because oftentimes we're faced by the lesser of two evils. And that's the classic ethical dilemma. How do you deal with two things that are both bad and you have no other choice? Well, you pick the one that is the lesser of those two evils, if you can, in terms of doing that. Now, there's also a third part to this, but it's even more problematic from an ethical perspective. And that is usually reserved for those people who have achieved a level of a bodhisattva where they're able to do this without creating too many problems for themselves in the process. And that is preventing other people from doing harm. Okay? So there's three parts. Do good, or at least do no harm. And also, if you're able to, I'll be able to then uh, prevent others from actually doing harm. Now, the reason that that's difficult is that when you do something to create, uh, re, uh, 
keep somebody else from doing harm, maybe for their own benefit or the benefit of somebody that they're trying to hurt, you may create bad karma for yourself in the process. In fact, there's a story of the Buddha uh, being on a ship where an individual was going to rob all of the people that were on the ship. And to keep this person from doing that, the Buddha killed this robber. Now, you can make all kinds of arguments about, well, there must have been a better way to do this than to kill this robber. Uh, but that's really not the point. The point is that he was trying to prevent him from doing harm. But by doing that, he also accrued the negative karma from having killed this individual. And so he went to the Dharma hell as a result of having done that. But while he was there, of course, he gave teachings and did things to help beings that were also in the hell realm at that time. But the idea is that you don't make extreme sacrifices unless you're in a position to really be able to do that with minimal harm to yourself. Okay? So this isn't an absolute requirement of keeping other people from doing harm. It's one of those that, yeah, it's a good idea, but be careful because you're treading on ice, thin ice, when you, when you try to do this kind of thing. So those are the, the basic parts of uh, what is involved there. So there is this altruistic piece that I like to mention here, and even though the altruistic piece gets emphasized in the ethics related to the Bodhisattva vow later on, the path of the Bodhisattva, it's also an element of what we're talking about here, the altruistic behavior. And you may be aware that scientists have found DNA evidence now of altruistic behavior among single cell beings. Okay? Kind of interesting. And some people don't believe that human beings have any innate altruistic behavior. Okay? That it's a learned kind of a behavior. But it turns out now that our DNA, which we inherited that same DNA, but it goes all the way back to single cell beings. Okay? Kind of interesting. So a key determinant then in terms of ethics is our intention. That becomes the key factor in terms of whether or not this creates good or bad karma. What did we intend to do? Okay. So sometimes we may have good intentions, but it doesn't work out very well. Now the result isn't very good. But as long as we had the good intention, that's the most important part of this. Okay. And if it doesn't work out, then maybe we do a purification practice or we apologize depending on what the circumstances and so forth. But intention is the key. But we just don't always know what the best right thing is, regardless of all these systems of setting up rules and all of the rules and so forth. It's sometimes very difficult to know exactly what the very best thing to do is. And so... Uh, we can do those kind of things. Now, one of the specific lists that I wanted to mention here is called the 10 non-virtues and the 10 virtues. So there are 10 virtuous, uh, non-virtuous actions that we avoid and 10 virtuous actions that we do. Now, it turns out there's actually nine because one of the 10 is repeated in there. But uh, those are actions that we do or don't do. But one of the things that's important to keep in mind here, once again, is that these are not hard and fast rules in Buddhism. We use what we call skillful means. So depending on the circumstances, the conditions, then we apply them to the best of our ability within those circumstances. Okay. So the first one, uh, read, read through the list of the 10 non-virtuous actions to avoid first. The first one is killing. Do not kill. And so from a Buddhist perspective, that's not just human beings. That's sentient beings. Sentient beings technically, although here again we run into some difficulty in determining exactly what kinds of animal beings in the animate world versus the plant world, what kind of animate beings actually are sentient or not. The rule is those beings who experience happiness or suffering. But we get different things from scientists about what kinds of things can experience happiness or suffering. 
So it's hard to say. Uh, most Buddhists at the time this was developed only knew about things that were visible. So you knew about insects, for example. It would have been among the smaller things and, and other things, fish, birds, animals, and so forth. And of course, human beings. Uh, but they didn't know anything about microbes. So whether microbes actually qualify as sentient beings, I don't know. Some people say they do, some people say they don't. Uh, so I don't know. But the idea is whenever possible, we want to avoid killing. The second one is stealing. Again, we do not steal. Uh, the technical wording is do not take what is not given, which is slightly different meaning than the way we usually use the word stealing, but stealing is the more common term. Sexual abuse is another one. The fourth one is lying. Number five is divisiveness, going to divide up people or groups. Number six is harsh words. Number seven is idle talk. This one can be a challenge at times. Number eight is covetousness or jealousy. Number nine is harmful thoughts. And number 10 is wrong views. And these would be looking at things, looking having an incorrect understanding of a Buddhist view of something, if you will. Okay, so the pairings of those, if you're writing them down, you can match these up one to one. Number one, the 10 virtuous actions is to protect life. So for example, you may see someone who actually goes and buys live fish. So a movie the other day, this person wasn't anything at all to do with Buddhism, but she went to the market and originally was going to buy three lobsters. With the amount of money that she had, she was going to buy three lobsters and set them free. Then she realized that she could buy 10 crabs for the same amount and set them free. So she wound up buying the crabs and so they were taking them to whatever body of water, the ocean, where they could set these crabs free. And about halfway there, she suddenly had this thought, I wonder how many shrimp I could have bought. <laughs> you know? uh, but the idea is that that's one of the practices that is often done. People will buy live fish that are, have been caught or birds that have been caught with the intention of killing them and eating them for food, and then setting them free. So that is a practice, but whenever possible, protecting life. So if you've got an insect, I have an, a little thing that I use at home to capture various forms of insects, and uh, without killing them, then I can then take them outside and set them free. So we protect life as best we can. Number two is generosity. So giving whatever we can. Number three is to honor sexual vows and respect others. Number four is truth and loving speech. So in speaking with others, we try to speak the truth and speak with loving speech. Number five is to reconcile or harmonize. So either individuals or groups. Number six, Pleasant words, so speaking with a pleasant tone of voice and so forth, saying nice things. Number seven, meaningful talk, as opposed to gossip. Number eight, generosity, again, here's the one that's repeated, as opposed to jealousy. Number nine, helpful intentions to benefit others. So there's that intentions piece again coming into play. And finally, number 10, wisdom of the ultimate truth and the true nature of things. Okay, so those are the 10 things to avoid, 10 things to do that are helpful. Now, the way the Buddha looked at these kinds of lists, if you will, as, as I mentioned, not that they are absolute, but that they are beneficial to your practice. So that's the basic idea. Are they helpful to what it is that you're trying to do or not? Anything that is helpful to you, that then is good, and those are the things that you should do. 
If it's not helpful to you, those are the things that you should avoid. But over time, they came up with these lists of 19 things, <laughs> some of which are helpful, some of which are not. And so, in general, using these kind of things as guidelines can be very helpful to you in doing your practice. Okay? But again, they're not absolute levels. Now, researchers have also found that we tend to develop our moral approach to things in stages. It's not just a black and white thing, you're moral or you're not moral. Uh, just like physical development, as we grow up, we go through stages of moral development. And the early stages of that moral development, we focus on rewards or the potential punishment that we might risk. Okay? And we often see this in young children. You know, they'll do things that they'll get a reward for, or they'll avoid doing things where they might get punished. Okay? And so the focus is really on me. Later on, would they begin to consider some reciprocity of what others might be willing to do for them. You know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. But the focus is still on me. Then as they grow and they uh, develop in the stages, then they begin to develop an appreciation for approval of other people. Their peers, their family, friends, others, those kind of things. And that then tends to grow to larger groups, the tribe, the community, and so forth as we go through. And so the focus begins to shift from me to we, if you will. One way to characterize that. Still oftentimes some me involved, but as we grow, it begins to shift and becomes more and more a focus on the broader context. At the next level, they may look at the kind of social contract and society as a whole. Uh, and then at the next level, they get to a point where it actually begins to shift from we to you. They begin to develop that altruistic element. So it goes beyond, it transcends the we to focus on things beyond that, uh, transcending the social ethic and transcending legal barriers and those kinds of things about what is right beyond what the law says. So in some cases, they may protest what the law says because they don't think the law is correct. They're not uh, protecting certain minority rights for example. And at the very highest level, there's this kind of egoless altruism that develops. And it really fits with the, the Buddhist kind of approach to how we develop our own sense of altruism uh, in Buddhism with the, from the ethical perspective. Now, a couple of signs of accomplishment, things that are indicators of how you're doing as you approach ethics. One is to reflect back at the end of the day on your own intentions. How did you do as you set your intentions with respect to the actions? Um, in terms of the day as a whole, how did you do, ethically speaking? Did you do fairly well, or did you maybe mess up a few too many times. <laughs> okay? And one way to do that, it was a tradition in the Tibetan tradition, is to carry a couple of sacks, or, or in your pockets, a couple of sacks of rocks. One filled with white pebbles, one with black pebbles. And every time you did an action that was good, you would take one of the white ones out and put it in a third sack. And every time you did something bad, you would take a black one out and put it in that third sack. At the end of the day, you open up that sack and say, well, how many white ones do I have? How many black ones do I have? And just by looking, it gives you very quickly a sense of how you did. So you might try something like that, rocks or beads or whatever that you have that might be black or white to do that. And interestingly enough, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, if you go through to the stage, you get to the stage where you meet Yama, the the uh, god, deity of death, if you will, he goes through that same process of, you may have seen that in the video, uh, you know, taking out and looking at the black ones and the white ones and seeing, 
kind of counting out your karma for this lifetime, the bad karma and the good karma based on the actions that you had. Are actions for self as well as others? All, I, All actions. actions. It's Very just good. actions. Yeah. You know, and how, how did those actions stack up? So it, it's a, got a parallel there. And so it may seem a little bit silly, but sometimes as we go through the day, we tend to create a halo effect. If you're familiar with perceptual errors, halo effect is a real common perceptual error. And we tend to remember the things that happened most recently. So if we did a couple of really good things toward the end of the day, we forget those not so good things we did earlier in the day. Uh, so having a record of those as you went through the day can actually be very helpful in keeping a more honest track of how you did in your action. So something to keep in mind as a way of doing it. So then you can do that for a week or a month, whatever time period that you want to do that, just to kind of get a general sense of how am I doing? And then you don't have to do it for a while, and then maybe a month later or a couple months later, try it again. See, okay, how am I doing for a little while, okay? So that's, that's a way that you can do it. Another way that you can do it is to check with others. How do they think that we are doing? A lot of times other people observe a lot more about us and how we're doing than we observe about ourselves. So we can ask. Now that runs a little bit of a risk because they might tell us things that we don't want to hear about ourselves. So we need to do that. But it's very important, first of all, that you have trust with the person and that you don't take it personally. So if they say, well, you did this or you did that that was negative, don't try to defend yourself. Don't try to rationalize your behavior. Say, thank you for telling me. Or if you're a little confused about what they said, why they said it, ask a question or two. Could you explain a little bit more? Or what about you know, and, and get them to tell you more detail, but never ever try to defend yourself or rationalize it or anything like that. You're strictly trying to get feedback and just leave it at that. If you try rationalizing, if you try any of that other stuff, you try defending yourself, you start to break down the trust and you're undermining the entire purpose of doing this. Okay? And so, Having that open and honest kind of communication is a very important part of this, but be very careful when you do this. So another thing then is to just review the vows that you've made. What are the commitments that you've made to doing and making sure that those fit with what you are willing to do, able to do. And then as a part of training your mind in those intentions, be sure that you're paying attention to what you're doing. Another one of those early trainings of the Buddha was mindfulness, okay? Paying attention. Now, from a Buddhist perspective, everything that we do in terms of time is considered to be short moments of time, okay? Little itty bitty moments. And so the idea is to pay attention is you're paying attention to a moment of time and another moment of time, and another moment of time, okay? That can actually be a helpful tool to you because we tend to think of time as a continuous process. But if you think of it more like a motion picture where it's frame, 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 even though it appears to be a continuous movement of time, and when you're doing that, it's easier to keep paying attention to all those little things. But we pay attention to our body, speech, and mind. All of those things. Now it's hard to do all three of those at the same time, so don't worry about doing that. But pick one, you know, follow your actions in terms of body for a while. You're eating, sit down, eat carefully, pay attention to each bite, each chew of that bite, swallowing, if you're drinking, each piece of that, and so forth. Uh, if it's speech, when you're talking to someone, being mindful about the conversation of who's talking, what they're saying, waiting for your chance to speak, then doing that mindfully, thinking about what you're saying, those kind of things. Being very mindful about it. 
or in terms of mind, your own thoughts, paying very careful attention to what's going on in your head, so to speak. What are the things that you're thinking? What is the nature of those things? Are they good? Are they helpful? Are they negative? Not helpful? You know, pay attention to, to each of those things. So being mindful, that's the key point there. So I want to conclude this part with a focus, uh, or a, a couple of sayings here, that comes from a book called The Life of Shabkar. Now Shabkar, I mentioned his name earlier, was this uh, yogi, uh, one of the really famous yogis in Tibet, uh, kind of a Milarepa type, and wrote this really long volume about uh, his experiences and thoughts and teachings and all kinds of things, uh, somewhat like Milarepa did. And so he says in his book, all that pleases the heart and mind of the spiritual masters and the three jewels, all that benefits others is virtue. This is what we need to accomplish. And then he tells this story about small virtuous actions, because we sometimes get caught up in wanting to do big things, okay? Even a small virtuous action brings great benefit. Once an old lady offered a single butter lamp to the Buddha, who then made a prediction based on a prediction that in the future she would become a Buddha named Bright Lamp, endowed with the ten powers. The Buddha who pro also prophesied that a village chief who kept the vow of not killing for a single day would ultimately become enlightened as the Buddha of beneficial speech. A Brahmin girl offered her needle to a bhikshu because of that she, was, she became the noble Shariputra. A woman offered a meal to a beggar. She was reborn in a mansion of jewels where she enjoyed delicious food with a hundred flavors. A pig who happened to make one circumambulation around a stupa because he was chased by a dog took rebirth as a household in the, as the householder Palke, who attained the level of an arhat. So it is said. Okay? So four examples of very, very small kinds of things that someone did, and yet they attained Buddhahood or Arhathood or whatever level uh, as a part of those small actions. So even the small things are actually big things in the long run. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. <laughs>